All right, thank you. So um, yeah, this is uh, Fabrice Goek. I'm responsible for the uh, crystallization facility at DLMB. Uh, the crystallization facility is used uh, by uh, any, uh, virtually by any LMB scientist, uh, mostly uh, from the structural studies uh, department, uh, the PNSE, and also the Cambridge University wing. On this first slide, you can see that the kind of crystals and diffraction pattern you want to you want to see uh, to have a chance to solve uh, a high resolution structure with X-ray crystallography. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the 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 road to reach this point uh, may be uh, quite difficult because uh, the crystallization conditions cannot be predicted. So here you see. Uh, the crystal structure deposited in the PDB uh, since uh, 2000. Uh, you can see that the, uh, according to the total number of entry uh, in light blue, uh, we are now uh, above 160,000 structures. And there's a steady pace uh, for a decade now of 10,000 structure released annually. And uh, this crystal structure by X-ray uh, crystallography, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't take into consideration a small proportion of interesting uh, structures solved by uh, neutral diffraction. Uh, there's an increasing uh, number of structures solved with uh, X-ray uh, laser. And, and also in those structures, it's not only protein, uh, it uh, includes uh, complexes like protein and DNA or RNA complexes, uh, oligosaccharide, uh, and also uh, nucleic acids on their own. Here you see some uh, data from the LMB uh, about the yield of crystals uh, that are obtained, useful crystals obtain uh, against uh, quite a lot of uh, conditions uh, during initial screen. Uh, so 1500 or 1600 more plus 1800 plus conditions here. Um, so despite the line of large number of conditions, we have a uh, yield of useful uh, uh, hits uh, that are uh, about 1%. And this is only cases where uh, useful crystals are actually obtained. So there's a lot of cases where, um, unfortunately, you don't have any hits uh, initially. So we could estimate that our initial yield is far lower than 1%. So here is a protein crystal that uh, you like to see in the light microscope. Uh, it's got, uh, it's three dimensional. Uh, it's got a symmetry, uh, which is visible. And it's probably uh, this um, visible symmetry was probably detected by the internal uh, symmetry, like uh, the type of symmetry uh, of the crystal lattice. Um, it's big enough to uh, be shot. Uh, we have for that uh, to check the nature of crystals. We have uh, it's a single crystal as well. Sorry. Uh, we, so to, to, to shoot such single crystals, uh, we have a system uh, in-house, uh, which is uh, FRE plus bright uh, generator, which is the most powerful uh, generator uh, for in-house system. And we have a couple, it's associated with a couple of uh, MARDI TV detector. We also do remote collection uh, from Diamond and uh, DSRF, especially uh, to Diamond, I think. Uh, so for more details about that, uh, you would have to contact Dom, uh, which is our X-ray facility manager. Unfortunately, um, a lot of crystals are not, uh, doesn't diffract uh, as well as expected, even when they look nice, like the one I showed earlier. Uh, so the underlying, underlying reasons for that is basically that they are, um, the crystals are made um, with weak interactions, and there are limited uh, crystal contact areas. Uh, sometimes um, crystal hold only with, uh, you know, long range electrostatics uh, interactions and a couple of uh, hydrogen bonds. Um, so uh, that makes them um, usually, another factor, so it's like this, the density is not there. So there's high solvent content. So the result is that, most crystals are 
poorly ordered, and they also have structural defects. They're also very fragile, which makes any manipulation uh, difficult. One of the problems that uh, can't see by eye, uh, but that will reflect, uh, it will be reflected by a poor um, diffraction, is the mosaicity. So basically, uh, the unit cells of the crystals are, are poorly aligned. That will basically broaden the um, beams, diffractive beams, and a signal to noise ratio will be against you. Uh, because of that. So that's one uh, very common reason why uh, the crystal doesn't diffract well. Other crystal pathology is twinning. And here it's, uh, it's represented by a kind of uh, simple case, so to speak, <laughs> uh, where you have basically the crystal is made of two crystals uh, that grow in different direction. So Crystal, there are more tricky cases than that um, that could prevent them to solve the structure at the end. So you may see a nice diffraction pattern, but you would have problem to solve the structure because of the twinning. So the sample uh, is the main variable when you try to tackle uh, protein crystallization. And there's a plethora of uh, molecular biology techniques. Uh, I'm just going to uh, you know, introduce a few here. Uh, in general, um, you're trying to, the shorter uh, the sequence, the smaller the protein, the more chance you have to succeed. Uh, you also want to kind of rigidify the protein if you can, because uh, it's too, such a soft uh, entity. Um, so that's what you will, the, the approach you will uh, aim at in general. Although it's not always the case, sometimes you, you need um, larger protein and more complex samples to succeed. I will mention an example in a minute. But to illustrate the um, importance of uh, varying the sequence of your protein for crystallization, I like to uh, mention the inherited uh, cataract. Um, that's, we were, it's basically a single mutation from a, a protein from your eye, the lens of your eye cause cataracts, um, and then it's, it's, it's because this protein crystallized, and that's obviously a serious problem, which is caused with only a single point mutation. Now, a single point mutation is not really what you do when you initiate, uh, you know, project for uh, crystal, uh, to crystallize a protein. Uh, this is more a um, matter of optimization later or done for drug discovery purposes on the binding pocket. You will, you will start with a bit more drastic modification of the sequence for your initial experiments. An experimental way to um, get rid of some a part of the protein which are maybe on the way of a crystal contact is those like those flexible uh, external loops. So you could do that uh, by limited proteolysis where you put some enzymes in your sample and try to not have it all fully eaten, but just have the flexible, uh, very accessible loops removed. Uh, and then you, so to find out the new uh, sequence that you have without the loop or loops that have been removed, you will need um, mass spec. Uh, and we have a mass spec facility, which will help you with this kind of thing and many other things. So then you will reproduce, you will produce the, the, the modified uh, protein and we try to crystallize it again without those, uh, those flexible loops. Now an example where actually you do a longer sequence because you're adding a lysozyme <laughs> Uh, protein uh, that you fuse with the protein of stress is, is the case of uh, GPCR, where you have a T4 lysozyme uh, fused on the N terminal. And because the, um, the lysozyme may provide uh, surfaces that um, uh, are involved in uh, crystallizing the lysozyme very easily, uh, you, may, you may have more chance to crystallize your protein this way, which was the case here. Another way where well, you have a larger protein than you wanted initially uh, is to use the um, chaprons uh, with antibody fragment here on the GPCR again. 
And this will have effect to more to stabilize uh, the protein and it also offer new uh, possible surface context for uh, crystallization. Well, before uh, uh, going and uh, trigger smart, smart, uh, smart bio molecular biology approach, um, there's some uh, essential consideration that you consider for any sample. So the molecular weight, like I mentioned already before, uh, you you tend to try to have shorter sequences to to increase your chance because simply because also it will be make the protein more more uh, st more stable and uh, less flexible in general. But you want to aim at high, you know, highest molecular weight as possible to have the most relevant structure as possible. So there's a compromise to find there. Purity, obviously, uh, although for some proteins or some complexes, it's not always possible to have ultra pure a sample. Never mind. Um, you do all the hard work that you can on the purification, and if it's not perfect, uh, you know, you're having a goal because the crystallization is quite an exclusive process. Um, so. It may work even if it's not super pure. Uh, the concentration, I would say two mix per meal of protein is the minimum, but 10 to 15 mix, uh, which correspond to the average of uh, the concentration we see before on the table with the MRC, uh, LMB samples, uh, 10 to 15 mix is a better start. Uh, solubility, so obviously it's a very important factor. So I will test early the effect of dissolving the sample. So we don't want the sample to be too happy in solution and not, um, you know, um, so, that, so that the effect of all the other salt that you're going to test after uh, is going to be um, maybe, uh, uh, it will be hard to see, to, di to dissolve the sample then maybe. I would also check uh, early the effect of adding glycerol. Uh, it's quite common to that, um, adding glycerol has a positive effect. Uh, and also uh, the buffer pH, obviously, because the, um, the density of charge on the protein surface will change with the pH. So you want to try, you want to, try to change the pH as well. Uh, very in the process, we have a buffer screens, actually, uh, and, uh, available in plates, uh, pre-filled plates at the, at the protein crystallization facility. So we could check uh, ahead the effects of different buffer pHs. Now you also want to look at the stability of your sample. Um, and this could include the conformation, uh, oligomerization states. The polymerization is uh, if they're polymerized, obviously you need to seriously investigate that before uh, you're trying to crystallize it. Uh, and, then, and for, for all of this, you will have uh, bio, biophysical assays uh, uh, that can be helpful as well to check the thermal stability with thermal shift assays, uh, dynam dynamic light scattering, and many other assays. And for this, uh, I'm sure the people from the biophysics facility and the NMR facility uh, will be uh, of much help uh, for that. So. A lot of angles to investigate uh, your sample and try va uh, to uh, variations uh, before you rescreen you rescreen it for protein crystallization. A crystallization experiments now. Uh, before I present the most commonly employed experiments with vapor diffusion, I like to see this uh, solubility phase diagram. Uh, because the most all the met crystallization methods are based on increasing the saturation of the experiments. Uh, and here, um, so it's a two dimensional view of, uh, of this. And radically, the, the, the protein crystallize uh, in the, what's called the super saturation zone. And here through the curve, you see that uh, when the saturation increase, well, the protein crystallization increase as well. Uh, this is done by increasing the concentration of the precipitant agent. You go through a metastable zone, a nucleation zone, so we're getting really saturated at this stage. And then if the crystal nucleate, it will be uh, in this zone. And if you go a bit too far, obviously, uh, you have a precipitation. Um, so there are a lot of other parameters to consider. This is just to, to have a visual, something to view uh, the process of uh, getting more um, uh, saturated. 
Um, but so if you want, there are other, so for example, you have oligomeric states may vary according to the level saturation level. There's a lot of other parameters in experiments such as the, the surface tension, which may affect the stability of the sample, etc., etc. You have also um, sample that crashes first, precipitate first, but then reverts and crystallize. So. Um, it's usually a uh, lot more complicated than, than this. Um, one thing that you want to remember from this um, graph is that the crystals preferably grow in the metastable zone, which is a low, at a lower saturation level than nucleation, while all the methods are based on, a, on steadily increasing the saturation. So it's a bit contradictory to the method. So here is the main uh, representation of the main method, which is the vapor diffusion. So basically, you have a chamber uh, with a reservoir with your condition, um, which contain at least uh, a precipitant. And you will mix this condition with uh, the sample to form a droplet on top of this reservoir. So because because the reservoir, uh, because the drop is uh, um, has less uh, precipitant than in the reservoir, you have um, a dehydration of the drop by osmolarity. So the that's how the concentration uh, of the protein drop uh, rises. So here it's an interesting case, uh, which I call the phase diagram droplets. So you're in the in this uh, vapor diffusion droplets set up by uh, Mark. Um, you can see the different phases, uh, precipitation, uh, nucleation, macrocrystals, and relatively uh, larger crystals. Um, so in this case, you can be almost sure that uh, it's protein crystals uh, even before you shoot them. Um, you, can also, you could also have a doubt about uh, uh, something that's there's probably liquid-liquid diffusion before vapor diffusion. And that would be because at this scale, with the, the small droplets, uh, we don't really mix the, the, the condition, the precipitant, with the protein sample. So at the beginning, uh, you could suspect that there's liquid liquid diffusion uh, at the same time as vapor diffusion. So in condition, there's not only precipitant. Usually, we have uh, three main uh, categories, which is precipitant, buffers, uh, and additives. And to sample uh, all those, the, the plethora, plethora of uh, suitable reagents, uh, we design screens. Uh, so there's a grid screen, which is a systematic approach, um, which uh, cover, um, here is, sorry, I, I, I represented three different uh, type of uh, formulation in a, by a virtual space. And in this virtual space, there's, 40, there's small, 48 small cubes, which represents the 48 combinations of uh, three uh, components, could be a precipitant, a buffer, and an additive, for example. Could be concentration of precipitant as well. Uh, but anyway, it's um, there's three, three variables here, three components. And the grid screen on the left, so it's very systematic, but obviously if you have a lot of components, if you have lots more components than that, you wouldn't be able to cover nicely the, the, the virtual, this virtual space of screening. So usually the grid screens are used more for optimization purposes when you have a more limited number of components to investigate. For initial screens, there's the two other sampling method. So you have incomplete factorial, which is in a way a spread out grid screens with um, combinations that have been omitted. And there are different ways to, to formulate this. Usually you could just simply do it uh, randomly. So you will omit some combination randomly to design an incomplete factorial strains. It will be more or less biased to our previous experiments as well. Uh, depends on what you want to do with this. And then on the right, there's the other uh, typical formulation which was sparse matrix here. So here sparse matrix is simply um, an empirical selection of uh, conditions that have been successful in the past. So again, it will be more or less biased towards um, some samples or some reagents or or less 
by us if you want to keep it uh, wide open you will it will be based on a very large subset of sample so that's the three typical formulation there's an alternative of uh, for formulating screen which is to base the formulation on uh, uh, additive mixes but i'm not going to uh, introduce this today our main strategy at the LMB, at least for novel samples, is to uh, is to offer a broad variety of screens that are already available in uh, pre-filled 96 well plates, which we call the LMB plates. That means that uh, people can have um, can choose a screen which is assumed to be more appropriate to uh, their sample. Although we would advise uh, to do a large initial screen where you took the 23 LMB plates and that all together form uh, a large initial screen of 2200 plus conditions. Uh, so even when doing relatively small droplets on her straightforward protocol on the mosquitoes by doing 100 nanometer protein drops with 100 nanometer protein conditions, if you calculate the amount of sample you need uh, over 23 plates like that, it's 368 microliters of sample. Considering that it's concentrated sample, you're talking about milligrams of protein, so which sounds uh, quite a large amount nowadays. Fortunately, there's a technology that will enable to <laughs> reduce the, the required amount of sample we need. So we're going to integrate a such technology it's called ECHO, which is a, um, it's not a classic liquid handling uh, technology. It's uh, acoustic uh, droplet ejection technology. So it's enabled to do lots smaller, precisely lots smaller drops. And we tested it uh, with 10 nanoliter plus 10 nanoliter droplets, uh, work really well. And we're going, to, we are going to integrate this at the protein crystallization facility very shortly. With all those conditions to analyze the result uh, after you assess your experiments, we have the web-based interface, uh, which was designed in collaboration with uh, Paul Hart from the IT department. Basically, you would, uh, you can, uh, so it will show you uh, the formulation of the condition selected. Uh, you can also um, transfer those condition in the Excel format, uh, which can be quite useful to do basic data mining. There are other functions as well, which I'm not going to present today, but I invite you to go, uh, it's quite straightforward. Uh, so I invite you to consult the, this LMB screen database. It's also a better area of optimization protocols once you, after your initial screening. Uh, I'm going to present only one, which is really fundamental uh, because you invest you need to investigate the concentration of your main component, main reagents, uh, before anything else, uh, because you're going to uh, Maybe you're going to optimize your crystals already with this, and also you need to make sure that you will reproduce at least the crystals with the stock solutions so that you can do um, any, any other subsequent optimization you're in control of these. But for the first step to investigate the concentration of uh, the main component, uh, we're using the four corner method, which is uh, ideal for this. And there's some preparation to do uh, and we have an Excel applet available uh, on, the la on the link there at the bottom of the page. Uh, you can go and see that. That will help you to formulate the four corner solution that you required uh, to do uh, this screen. You will bring those four, those four conditions that you prepare manually in tubes to the liquid handler. We have the Dragonfly to do that. Uh, very straightforward protocol again. So the robot is going to mix uh, the four conditions, uh, the four solutions, sorry, that you prepared uh, at different ratios across the plates, and you will end up with a nice two-dimensional gradient of concentration screen. Nucleation and growth. So oh, interestingly, this cryo-EM is giving you giving us more clues about uh, nucleation, <laughs> um, which is the really the rate uh, limiting steps. So we can see that there's already a quite a high uh, order, a quite a high level of order straight away. Um, 
doing nucleation um, is only few macromolecules uh, that form the cluster. Uh, and then we can see there. Um, so after that, there's um, what's happening is you have what they call building blocks in these two Ds. This is two D uh, based on glucose isomerase. And so according to different um, associations of these uh, building blocks, you, you may have uh, different crystal uh, at the end or uh, something else like a disordered gel. So basically what I wanted to say about that is that it's interesting to see that there's already a kind of high degree of order straight away and that the pathway to crystallization um, is established very uh, early. That's, um, you may have a problem uh, during the growth uh, because basically what's happening is at the surface of um, the microcrystals, you will have different two-dimensional patches that grows uh, independently. And obviously at some point they may, they may clash with each other, which is called spiral dislocation. So that creates, you know, uh, a lot of defects in the crystals. Another problem during growth is what's called poisoning. So during the crystal growth, you may have partially denatured proteins or other contaminants that are integrated uh, in the crystallitis. And it's actually the main cause um, of termination of growth. But, I'm taking the opportunity to say that uh, this is one good reason as well to screen smaller crystals. Like bigger is not always better. Uh, things can only get worse with growth. Obviously, the size of the crystal is important uh, because the volume of the crystal that is shot, the intensity of the diffraction spots are directly, uh, you know, proportional to the volume of the crystals that you have. Uh, but um, the structure of the crystal itself doesn't get better with growth uh, unless you really, really super <laughs> optimum, <laughs> optimized everything, which uh, you know, I hope you do. <laughs> but um, just don't forget to, to screen also smaller crystal, not only the big ones. It may also make a difference uh, for the other parameters like cryoprotections, but that's, that's another story. If you remember uh, doing the, uh, for the, uh, the, phase the phase diagram, the solubility phase diagram, the, the crystals, um, the ideal um, area, uh, zone of saturation for growing crystals is a lower saturation than the, where they nucleate eventually. So a way to, buy, to optimize this is to use seeding. So basically you will use the crystals that you obtain uh, previously, and then you put them in the new experiments. So this way, uh, you already have crystal presence when the experiment reached the metastable uh, zone, and it's a way to optimize uh, crystal growth. It's also, you know, basically, uh, it helps to um, break the energy barrier of nucleation. Um, you need to obtain crystals first to do this. So that's an optimization that you do when you uh, have crystals. So the crystal you use is either micro crystals, uh, and there are different techniques to for seeding. So you can grab micro crystals um, simply by stroking the drops where you had uh, where they are, and then and then uh, place them the same way uh, in the in the other drops. You can also uh, fish larger crystals that you have, um, fragment them by crushing them, and in, then introduce them in the new experiments. So the screen you're going to use for this is going to be optimized accordingly to uh, the saturation level, um, or you could simply rescreen with initial screens, like uh, with a random aspect again uh, with the seeds. So there's um, 
some tutorial, uh, there's a mini uh, tutorial available uh, to help you with protein crystallization. Uh, I just mentioned a couple here. The one from Therese Blackford uh, is very nice. Uh, she's an expert. She will explain us better than me, seeding and, and, and show you all the techniques that you can do for that and other things. Also a nice uh, video on uh, Jovi. Journal of uh, Visualized Experiments made by Yorgo Modis, um, which is uh, with us at the University of Cambridge Wing. And uh, it's a bit short. <laughs> I will conclude uh, there. I was too long last time. I'm too short this time, but uh, it's how it is. So I've got more time for questions. Thank you very much. What approach would you take for crystallization of protein complexes with compound? Aha, uh -huh. I mean, it's this, uh, yes, that's a tricky one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I will talk only about the crystallization protein, crystallization itself, because uh, obviously there will be a lot of background work to do. Um, my view in general is that you don't want to think too much. You don't want to assume too, main, too much. So assumptions uh, are your main enemy. Um, the idea is that you prepare a sample which is stable and concentrated enough and still um, do a relatively large initial screens. Um, obviously, if you really want to assume <laughs> uh, few things, then you could try screens which are, have, um, are not too concentrated. Uh, we have some uh, like LMB6, which is um, lower, which has lower concentration of uh, reagents. Uh, you may try what I call soft screen. So it's a big base screen as well. Um, Again, but as some you will obviously look in the literature if there's anything that helps uh, people with similar uh, samples. But again, um, I'll be careful with that because um, the material method of the <laughs> protein crystallization uh, often hides uh, hundreds of uh, film experiments. So my advice would be to use the, the potential of the, our protein crystallization platform and try many initial screens once you have a relatively stable and concentrated sample, not doing assumption, but use what we, the power uh, uh, that we have at the um, facility and screen as many, uh, screen as many, um, use as many screens as, as, as possible. So there's no really, again, I, I, don't, I don't want to assume things according to the nature of the sample. I, I'll keep it open-minded and, and, and use different screens. That's what I would do. What are the advantages and disadvantages of hanging drop crystallization between sitting drops? So the sitting drops, we do that because it's uh, cost effective, <laughs> it's amenable to automation. Uh, in most cases as well, it's easier, it's going to be easy to fill the crystal. You just open uh, the top of the experiments, go in and fish. So that's three main reasons why we use um, seating drops. Um, it's, I don't think it's proven what technique is better, hanging drop. There's also liquid, uh, liquid uh, diffusion a technique which is really good uh, theoretically for crystallizing, uh, but practically it's um, it's more it's more difficult to set up and to extract the crystals from micro micro channels. So, so for the the hanging drop, uh, though theoretically uh, you may have an advantage is. Um, um, no, sorry, practically for sure. You have one advantage is that you may not have, the crystal can be stuck at the bottom of the well, which happens sometimes uh, with, uh, with sitting drops. So that's a problem. Uh, theoretically as well, uh, you may have differences because of the, um, the way it hangs. Um, you may, the, the effects of the gravity 
uh, may be reduced. So you may have, you have some advantages with hanging drops. Um, it's all, it's more and more a question of what's, uh, what's beats what uh, practically. And basically, practically, we uh, the, 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 the sitting drops, uh, it's hard to beat. Uh, usually people will swap to hanging drop because they have crystals stuck at the bottom of the, of the well. And that's why they will uh, use hanging drop. Um, what technique is better fundamentally, it's hard to say. Um, this is also another reason why we have a large initial screen. So we bypass um, a certain aspects uh, by doing a, a, by multiplying the, the experiments. So to try to cover as many parameters as possible, um, even if it's not always, uh, even if um, the seating drop experiments are not, uh, you know, always. Um, uh, the best for all the parameters, uh, but no te every, every technique has pros and cons, basically. Um, so if you use hanging jobs, uh, it's a bit harder to set up a real automation. <laughs> uh, we can do that though. We have a seal uh, that's stuck on the, our standard plates to do hanging jobs with uh, the mosquito. So we can look at that. Uh, but usually this is something that you will proceed after doing optimization. After you do large screening with our standard protocols with sitting drop, you will swap to, to hanging drops. Do you have any tips for protein peptide crystallization, micro affinity range, just add excess peptide and proceed with screen? Yes. <laughs> The answer in the, in the question. So that's all those. Awesome. I mean, I hope you did your homework with some biophysical <laughs> assays. Uh, but at this stage, it's hard to know what proportion um, of uh, peptide or the same for compounds. It will be the same approach as with uh, a smaller compound. Uh, the rule of thumb is that you put 10 times um, the um, KD. Um, so lots more than you need. You can put more. Obviously, if it's a very strong uh, compound or sample, you don't want to alter the chemistry of the, 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 the condition. Uh, for example, some peptide may be uh, very acidic. So if you put too much, you will change, you, you will completely bias the experiments toward acidic um, uh, solutions, which you don't want that. So I wouldn't put too much either, uh, but put lots more than enough, yes. And then you will proceed again, same uh, idea. You will proceed normally after that. Uh, don't assume too much. Um, obviously, theoretically, uh, for example, very highly high salt conditions may dissociate complex. Um, that's true, but if it's what if you need high salts to to crystallize the sample, this uh, because it won't crystallize in a PEG solution or relatively diluted dilute condition. Uh, then uh, you know you have to work hard how to make your complex more stable. Um, but yeah, again, ideally, uh, then after that, uh, you screen as many um, a screen an initial screen as large as possible. Uh, if you don't have choice, then because you don't have enough sample, and then you will try to be smart and select some screen for whatever reason. Um, which I will help you uh, with that. That will be a more case-to-case -case basis. So just come and see me and then we'll go through the screens and try to be smart there. Again, I'm saying try to be smart because I don't want to assume too much. But yeah, uh, that's, there's no, you can't, you can't predict that much uh, in that case either, I'm afraid. So there's another question. Do you suggest that I perform a few biophysical, biophysical experiments first, like ITC or MST? Yes, I mean, anything, any, there are this, and there are many others. Uh, I mentioned earlier dynamic glass scattering to observe the oleg oligomeric states, uh, thermal shift assays to check the stability. Any, any, any tests that you can, you know, that can make your approach put a bit more, um, a bit more rational. Uh, approach. The problem is when you have samples that are very difficult and there will be also probably, there will be limits uh, with what you can do on the biophysical assay too. So 
Um, sometimes it's a matter of uh, proceeding uh, with crystallization straight after the sample is prepared because you don't have time to. Uh, I mean, you, you, it depends also how hard it is to, to produce because if you can reproduce um, uh, the sample, is it then you proceed by step? Uh, you produce a, a batch to do biophysical assays, and then uh, the week after that, you produce the same, uh, the, exactly the same batch to do crystallization. It depends on how easy it is to produce and to um, to uh, and how stable it is. Um, you can see people um, desperately coming at the protein crystallization facility with a sample that they just produced and 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 um, concentrated. Um, so um, yeah, it depends on the case. But if you if you can, uh, you know, go for it. Any any kind of angles you can investigate is good. But you can't always do it. And also, it's not always um, correlated. So what you see um, in biophysics tests is usually uh, according to one parameter. And it's also in a diluted, the protein is a very low concentration. So it's not, it's not, we can't always make a parallel with what's happening in a highly saturated condition of protein crystallization. Uh, you know, some pool. So that's the only, the, 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 the real test is the crystallization, basically. Um, and you can, another thing that you can do is to analyze the um, crystallization experiments, even if you fail to crystallize. So um, there's not always things that you can see uh, with this, but for example, in cases where you have a, a very small uh, proportion of clear drops, that's uh, precious information. So the protein crystallization uh, became uh, biophysical assays, where you looked at the stability of your protein in uh, highly saturated conditions, and you found, and then you will go and um, look at the formulation of those conditions where the drops are stay cleared, and you will use the LMB screen database for this. And you will see if there's a trend in the chemistry. And then that may enable you to make choices, to go backward and make choices for your purification protocol uh, or biophysical assays, according to what you see in protein crystallization experiments at high level of saturation. For example, it, you, you, you see that um, uh, you found a buffer. So those conditions had a buffer in common, uh, buffer pH. And so you may want to use this pH uh, earlier in the process for purification and biophysical assay. And so and after, after that, uh, we screen the sample that is not prepared with a different buffer. You can find a salt, um, which, you know, make uh, we stabilize your sample. Um, yeah, so there are, you know, it, it depends on the cases, really. <laughs> there's always different. Uh, Different approach. So, um, if there's no other question, because it's a bit of time, uh, I will mention that uh, again about initial screens. We we constantly develop um, new initial screens uh, that we test um, for either biased or a subset of samples or or other reasons or to broaden uh, the chemistry of our uh, initial screen, do something different, complement it. And recently, uh, we developed a new crystallization screen uh, based on uh, all the results with the other screens that we made in the past, uh, with the morphine screens. It's called the fusion screens, and it's now integrated as standard screen in the LMB23 plates. So I invite you to uh, test this new strains, which is suitable for almost any kind of samples, good for protein complexes as well, spike based, theoretically it is. Uh, can be tried with membrane. I've got a uh, new screen as well for membrane proteins, um, which has a very high concentration of pegs. Uh, so we have an all type of screens with low, low, like relatively low concentration, relatively high concentrations, all the different formulation, grid screens, sparse matrix, incomplete factorial, uh, additive screens. So you got a lot of things to play with. So I'm just inviting you to come and try uh, as long as you can uh, concentrate the sample uh, a few mix per meal. 
just have a go, whatever, whatever type of sample it is. Uh, whatever you did a lot of homework with the purification or the biophysical assay or not, um, it's very straightforward to have a go and um, what is the, you know, with this broad variety of uh, screens that you can choose from. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I will um, stop there and it's 